I was interested in consciousness, so I started studying how anesthesia works. I was interested in basic mechanisms, and I was interested in microtubules. So I, I did a lot of uh, computer modeling of microtubules as information processing to see how they could compute and process information. And I worked with physicists. Uh, before I met Roger, uh, Steen Rasmussen, who was at Los Alamos, a nonlinear uh, a chaos theory guy, and Jack Tusinski and some other people, and published a lot on, on microtubule information processing, mostly from the theoretical standpoint. And, uh, and then I uh, got into experimentation later. Uh, so uh, I was going around to neural net and AI meetings. The, the point was that, that um, you know, most people say the brain is a complex computer of simple neurons. So each neuron would fire or not fire, and that would be like a, a bit, like a one or a zero in a computer. And uh, at, at synapses, so if you had enough, uh, uh, enough complex computation, you would get consciousness emerging at a higher level of, of, of complexity. And that's the st that was and remains the standard I, uh, explanation. And uh, I didn't think that was right because if you look at uh, a single cell, so a neuron is a cell, so uh, it can fire or not. But if you look at one cell like a paramecium or an amoeba or a tetrahymen or all these uh, simple one cell creatures, they're, very, they're quite clever. They can swim around. Uh, they have cilia made of microtubules that swim them around or sense. And so they, if they, they can avoid obstacles, they can avoid predators, they can find food, they can find a mate, they can have sex, two paramecium fuse actually, and, and uh, have sex, and uh, uh, they can learn. If you suck them into a capillary tube, they, they escape faster each time. So a paramecium is far, fairly clever. I'm not saying it's conscious. I, actually, it could be, but at a very slow rate. Mm. But it's intelligent, it has, some, it has information processing. So if, if a, um, I, I asked my uh, you know, colleagues, you know, if you were going to design a machine, a computer to do what a uh, paramecium does, you need an enormous computer. You know, how are you going to do that? Whereas you're saying that each neuron is a one or a zero, that's a big insult to neurons. So that was a point I was making. I was going to neural net meetings and AI meetings. And, and for example, uh, they were trying to reproduce uh, consciousness in a computer, um, assuming that there were... Uh, uh, 100 billion neurons, which is about right, with a thousand synapses at 100 hertz gives you 10 to the 16th operations per second. So that was the capacity of the brain according to the singularity, Ray Kurzweil and all those guys. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we have a computer with 10 to the 16th ops per second, we'll have brain equivalents, everything the brain does, including consciousness. Well, they went past that years ago, but uh -huh. I was saying that, no, if you look inside each neuron, there's about a billion tubulins at oscillating at 10 megahertz, radio frequency oscillation frequency. So you have 10 to the 16th operations. A billion microtubules per neuron? A billion tubulins. The, tubulins. The proteins that make up the microtubules. Oh, okay. So maybe hundreds of microtubules, depending okay. on that. And uh, so uh, a billion tubulins oscillating in mega, megahertz gives you 10 to the 16th ops per second per neuron, which is what the singularity people were saying for the whole brain. So I was saying, no, your target's way, way downstream. You know, they were going to a funding agency, give us a few more billion or trillion and we'll have conscious computers. And I was saying, no, bullshit. You, that, that's the capacity of one neuron. You know, your target's way, way downstream. They didn't like that very much. They basically told me, you know, get out of here. Who, who are you? And uh, what do you know? And I said, well, I study uh, the brain, you know. So uh, but w one day somebody said, okay, wise guy, let's say you're right. How would that explain consciousness? you know, love, feelings, joy, uh, pain, uh, pleasure, all this and that, it doesn't not automatically come from computation. And this later became known as the hard problem uh, by philosopher David Chalmers. And when it was posed to me, I think it was probably about 1990, uh, I didn't have an answer. I realized I was a reductionist and I had been saying that consciousness came, came from information processing and microtubules but I didn't have a mechanism for consciousness. Information processing, yes. Intelligence, yes. Computation, yes. Consciousness, no. It's a different, it's a different thing. So uh, fortunately, this person suggested I read a book by Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind, which I did. And uh, he had a mechanism for consciousness based on a quantum mechanism, quantum collapse. So I read this in about 91, 92. And, um, and the first part was about how... Uh, Consciousness can't be a computation because he used something called Gödel's theorem, which basically says a mathematical theorem cannot prove itself. You have to be outside the system to judge, like a mathematician can can say, okay, that theorem is true or not. You need to be outside the theorem. 
And so Roger extrapolated that to say that understanding, conscious understanding, has to be outside the system. So there must be something other than our classical computation. And that other has to be quantum, because that's all there is the, uh, outside of classical. If you, once you get it outside classical physics, you're in quantum physics. So mm -hmm. he said there must be a quantum uh, explanation for consciousness. And uh, by the way, that explanation would also solve what's called the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, which is a whole nother problem, uh, but turns out they're related. So in quantum mechanics, okay, let me, let me back up on this. So um, we have basically two worlds. We have the, our classical world that we're familiar with. That material world? Material world, right. And uh, where things are, are predictable, things are in one place at the same time follow Newton's laws, Maxwell's equations, and uh, uh, are fairly large, although the size, the, size, the exact cutoff is, is vague, that's, and that's the problem. Um, but then if you go small, we know that things can be in multiple places at the same time. A particle can be here, here, and here at the same time. Uh, and yet if we measure it or observe it, it collapses to one or the other. So this is called collapse of the wave function. Yeah. So in the quantum world, things- the observer can, effect. Yes, yeah. so if we uh, measure it, or some people said consciously observe it, then it collapses. So that led to the idea that consciousness causes collapse of the wave function, or consciousness collapses the wave function. And that was the, fir the first idea. Uh, then other people had other ideas that uh, each possibility, that there was no collapse, each possibility evolved and formed its own universe leading to an infinite number of overlapping universes, the right. many worlds hypothesis. Right. And a lot of people believe that because you don't have to deal with consciousness, you don't have to deal with collapse, and all you have to deal with is the infinite number of overlapping universes, which doesn't seem to bother them. It seems kind of silly to me, but a lot of people uh, believe that. And Meaning that, that every decision that we make during the day gets uh, branches off into its own universe. And 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 the opposite, the alternative uh, decision is has its own universe too. So if you order uh, uh, pizza for lunch uh, in another universe, you ordered uh, turkey sandwich, something right. like that. I mean, a lot of people actually believe that. And um, um, But Roger Penrose said that uh, uh, he came along with, an, among another set of explanations, which are called objective reductions in which there's an objective threshold for reduction of the wave function. So uh, in other words, reduction or collapse, they're the same thing, occurs spontaneously due to a law of nature, which, which he derived from the uncertainty principle at a time t equals h bar over e, which is the amount of superposition. So that any superposition would hit the threshold and then collapse. And when that happened, and here was the real kicker, there would be a moment of experience, of conscious uh, pr or proto-conscious awareness if it was really small and random. So rather than consciousness causing collapse, which had been around for uh, at least 100, 100 years or so back then, it was the opposite. Collapse occurred spontaneously and caused consciousness. So it was the first and remains the only source of consciousness ever put forth other than hand-waving emergence. You know, you get complex enough and consciousness happens without any explanation of why. So it was, a, it was a true mechanism and it put consciousness at the very basic fundamental of the universe because he related, well, the first question he addressed, which is, is still amazing to me, uh, how, how can things be in multiple places at the same time? How can a particle be here, 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 and here at the same time? Mm -hmm. And for that, he, uh, he resorted to using uh, Einstein's general relativity with space-time curvature. So Einstein realized that there was a space-time metric that mass was related uh, uh, mass was related to curvature in space-time. So there was this underlying metric or space-time continuum, and if it curved enough, you had mass. So he said, "Well, okay, something like the sun, which is obviously massive, would have a big curvature, and therefore you should be able to see stars on the other side of the sun." here on Earth because the light would be curved around the sun and we'd see it here on Earth. And so mm. uh, Eddington in 1919 did, uh, went to, during an eclipse, went to a mountaintop and, uh, and observed uh, stars that were known to be uh, behind the sun, which was blocked out by an eclipse, so he wasn't blinded. And he saw these stars that were known to be behind the sun because space-time curved it and he saw them and he proved Einstein's general relativity, and Eddington won a Nobel Prize. Uh, wow. Einstein had already won his, and there's a, a great picture of the two of them having a drink over it. So um, that was, uh, that. yeah, there it is. Um, 
you can see that the uh, the path of the starlight uh, is bent uh, is bent around the sun, and we can see it on Earth. That's so wild. that's Eddington's experiment. So that's for very big things. So Penrose applied it to uh, tiny things. He said, well, a quantum particle, a proton or electron or an atom, uh, would have a tiny curvature. And if, the, if that proton was here and here in two places, it'd be two tiny curvatures. And it, that would mean that there was actually a separation in space-time geometry, which he showed in these very clever two-dimensional diagrams so we can envision what it looked like. And so uh, uh, a, a, a superposition of being in two places at once was actually kind of a shredding or a blistering or separation in the fabric of the universe. And you can imagine that if each of these evolved, you'd get, uh, you get multiple universes. Yeah. Each one would have its own universe. So he said, no, the, the separation is, is unstable. And after this time, T will collapse to one or the other, giving off a, a moment of consciousness. So not only explaining a, a mechanism for consciousness, but avoiding the need for multiple worlds and solving the measurement problem in, in quantum mechanics. You didn't, it wasn't the conscious observer. It wasn't many worlds. It was this, this objective uh, uh, threshold that happened that gave you consciousness. So it was kind of uh, um, uh, taking two problems, killing two birds with one stone, or feeding two birds with one hand, or uh, and mm -hmm. and you you got both. And but nonetheless, it was ridiculed. Uh, Steven Pinker and David Chalmers uh, kind of uh, said, "Sure, one's a mystery, the other's a mystery. Let's make them the same mystery," <laughs> you know, as, as a derisive uh, ridicule. But actually, when you think about it, you know, Occam's razor. You want the simplest explanation. So if you have one solution to do grand, to two grand mysteries, I think that's a good thing. And I think that's what Roger discovered. That con that So he put together general relativity and quantum mechanics and got consciousness. It was actually three mysteries uh, uh, with one, one potential solution. 